Hi. Um, yeah, I'd like to bring the meeting to order if I could at 7.08. Did you want to just give a little a background on the um, web, webinar, how how it's used, uh, Mariah? Uh, the, the, um, just the introduction. You know what I mean? The, uh, the That this is because the governor, Baker, and all has allowed this and that that little introduction uh i don't i don't have that in front of me um Would you like me to do it real quick yeah thanks brian yep all participants are informed that this meeting is being recorded and broadcast live in accordance with massachusetts general law all questions submitted and participation becomes part of the permanent record and is taken at the discretion of the board chair Thanks, Brian. <laughs> um, I guess I'd like to start, if possible, with the meeting minutes that uh, Deb did for last meeting. Um, I just, they look very detailed, Deb. <laughs> I just looked them through. So uh, if we could bring those up. I don't, has anybody else had a chance to look through these? Uh, we we covered quite a lot of topics so um i'll go through them very quickly on a motion by mike and seconded by janice minutes of 10 16 were unanimously approved as amended on a motion made by mike and seconded by janice the minutes from 11 18 2021 were unanimously approved as amended ask some he to include a copy of the 11 28 uh, 18 2021 public hearing memo with the minutes so that was the um mariah had had rewritten the or i had done a draft and mariah had updated the public hearing memo from 11 18 and and rather than try to put all that detail into the minutes we, we were going to attach them to the minutes son he if that's okay so um moonlight resigned um last time and there was a one invoice for the recorder um two actually that i think i gave i i gave to brian and then a new one came in since the last meeting and i've given that to uh betsy to process new um uh, i'm sorry can't quite read that. Um, new here. What was it? New Shirley Bond. Oh, yeah, a new bond document. Security. I think that word's security. Um, bond. Is that right, Ryan? Uh, came in for the Boyden Solar. Was received. That was like the surety bond. Of yeah, it's the security bond on the properties. Yeah, and um, it was a public retailer for uh, cannabis in Orange and Gill. We opened the meeting at 7:15 for the public hearing that the select board uh, had submitted a, a for us to consider changing the word family to unit for in the single, two, and model family dwellings. Uh, mend the definition of multiple family dwelling from a dwelling containing three or more, but not more than four uh, dwellings separated by vertical horizontal walls designed for occupancy by not more than four families to multi-unit dwelling, a dwelling containing three or more units separated by vertical walls. Then the use table allow two unit dwellings by right and central village and village residential instead of special permit amend the use table allow multi unit dwellings by special permit in all zoning areas. Um, so Mark Burnett was he was part, there because they had an ANR and he had some questions and wondered why the cap of four units was removed. 
Um, Brian responded that they're working on redevelopment of the IP mill and Union 28 building strong housing, specifically affordable housing. Building is far below the requirement of 10%. Server is not proactive. This developer could seek a 40B process from the state so they could conduct a project in their Uh <clears throat> Mark asked, could Brian please explain the state requirement of 10% affordable housing? Response, Brian, the state has a requirement communities maintain affordable housing. Affordability is based on income in the area, so it's too specific. Irving is far below 1%. If the community fails below 10% and doesn't have a housing production plan in place, then a developer has the opportunity to seek relief from a zoning bylaw in a way of 40B process. Um, then George Moonlight Davis asked, one area that, that are considering doing the Molly family unit is renovator supply, is this correct response? Deb, no renovators is a privately owned site and the planning board has no knowledge of any plans for that location. Um, I said, wouldn't this open them up to put a Molly unit dwelling? Response, Brian, currently Molly unit dwellings are allowed in Central Village by special permit. So that that's still right now, it's a maximum of four units. Um, couldn't a developer come into town and, and take a town-owned property? The town could need to sell them. Is that correct? Yeah, so the two the town-owned properties, um, the town has control over it. Maybe there should be a committee to investigate before any changes are made. Are we being motivated to put housing at anywhere to follow state guidelines. Are we looking just to do it or responsible looking at how we can do it wisely for everybody? And response, Brian Irving is so far below the 10% housing guideline, a developer could seek relief from 40B. No, nothing is being done to simply put make meet a goal. Irving as a community has made specific decisions to limit the amount of growth that can happen. The town is trying to retain local control. I want to make sure we can implement the restrictions as we deem that necessary. Uh, <clears throat> I might express concern that when the planning board voted on changing Molly unit to special permit in all zones, there was a cap of four. Anywhere that a 50 developed moonlight goes will create a busy area and need for additional services such as police. This will be something the town will have to think about. Mike Schaefer, this would be taken into consideration during the special permit process. Mike also expressed he would like to see more detail as to the number of the size and size of the units. Mark brought up, are these going to be at the annual town meeting or special town meeting? He feels strongly that it be at an annual town meeting. How many other municipalities have gone this route that fell, fell felt they have to meet requirements set forth by the state is Irving leading and trailing these policies. Brian, currently being considered for a special town meeting, look back at the last 15 years, the majority of zoning changes have all been done at special town meeting. Irving is trailing behind on all issues. Many other communities have housing production plans in place. They've been working on this for years. Moonlight in general, we have been one of the one for integration and change in the town to have a wide variety of residents. Should we not really look at the place we could zero in and spot pick out to get give a developer so we can control where they build the project? Ryan, stirring the 50 unit con conservation conversation is a boss working on the IP mill. He had no knowledge of any other projects in any other area of town. He explained that even if this you change one aspect of zoning, for example, changing the cap from 40 to 20, Central Village, all the other zoning requirements and restrictions for Central Village zone would still apply. This would mean not all parcels in the zone could be able to model unit developments. That, 
that's like parking requirements, right, Brian? Things like that, I believe. Um, and how much of a lot can be taken up by a, a building? On a motion by Mike and seconded by Deb, the planning board voted unanimously to close the public hearing at 7:45. <clears throat> Mike made a motion to move to the French King Solar Gate move topic. Deb asked if we would be coming back to the board of select board hearing discussion topic. She noted the planning board had not discussed it and had not made a decision on the recommendations of the boss of the next step. Mike stated that he would like to see more information on caps for different zoning districts. In his opinion, would need to have a public sewer and water. Using the special permit process to review any potential plans could put a fair burden on the planning board. He would suggest potentially having a gradual caps across the zoning districts such as 50 in Central Valley, something in French King, something in uh, village residential and and gradually reducing to three or four in rural residential. Janice question is if we should look at property size and determine unit amounts, something along the lines of one acre lot could have up to 20 units. She spoke about being in Texas and how seeing buildings just seem to be put up anywhere. And we live in a country in it and like it that way. We want to be mindful. Uh, I lost my place. I'm sorry. Uh, we want to be mindful of development happen. She would like a bit more time to look into before making a decision. We don't want to set a cap too low and lose out on a good project, but also want to make sure we're making the best decision for the town. Deb expressed she agrees with Mike and Janice and wants mindful of how development happens. She finds Mike's idea of gradual cap interesting. She feels that some zoning areas are better than others for multiple unit dwellings. For example, she would want to see large projects in rural residential, but could see it could fit into the CV zone. She wants to make sure the special permit process is strong enough to cover all aspects we would want in reviewing large project. Brian asked for clarification. The planning board is potentially open to the definition of change, but potentially not open to the use table. My guess, we will continue research and wait until our next meeting to decide on a formal recommendation. So that was a lot. Thanks, Deb. <laughs> you did a good job capturing all that. Okay, French King Solar Gate request. Any any corrections there that anybody Let's see? Deb, I just have one correction on someone's name. At the very top, I think, um... I think John Mancini, you accidentally just hit C again. Okay, I've been looking at that all day, wondering if I did that. <laughs> okay. Uh, French King Solar Gate Change Request. Rob and Steve have presented the gate change request for the French King Solar Project. Eversource has requested the gate change to have fully unobstructed access to their equipment. Steve showed us on the plans where the gate was proposed and location, they are asking it to move to. French King continued um, 300 east from previous proposed. Brian confirmed that the gate would have a lock box, I think it is, not a Knox box, right? It's, no, it's Knox it's box. Oh, it is lock Knox box? K N O X. Huh. K A K N O X Knox. Correct. Huh. Key to Irving on its emergency per on a motion made by Mike and seconded by Janice, the planning board voted unanimously to approve the gate change. And um, Brian or Mariah will draft a memo noting the approval and provide to Steve. I don't know if that's happened yet, but I need uh, to send that over to you. Okay. Mark explained that currently. His own, he only has right of way for his driveway and the ANR will formally make the driveway part of his property. On a motion by Mike and seconded by Deb, the planning board will unanimously to approve the ANR for 25 Swamp Road. And draft public hearing memo. Uh, the board reviewed the draft hearing report from 
our November 18th, 2021 public hearing, Deb asked that the last paragraph stating that Mike Schaefer Express be removed as the conversation did not take place during the public hearing. Mike asked that it be noted that he and Peggy Sloan from FERCA both stated a PUD should have public sewer and water. He expressed concern that this has not been captured anywhere. It was pointed out that Mike had previously sent his concern to the boss on a motion made by Mike and seconded by Janice. So planning board voted unanimously, approved the draft public hearing report memo as amended, removing the last paragraph. Okay, any more? Is that it? Uh, okay, the budget uh, gave an overview of the planning board, but he let Janice know there are, are classes, seminars she could take if interested and in expenses would be covered by the budget. I asked what line item our postcard mailing and advertising came out of. Ryan said it was the expense line. I My question, if the board needs to set up clerical help, especially with the consultant coming on board, he stated it would be helpful to have someone scanning and emailing the planning board mail to him. This way he would not have to go to town hall to pick up. It could have been attached to our minutes electronically. Brian explained that this expense would have to come from our budget and that finding someone to fill a one to two hour weekly position would be difficult. Mike would like to explore hiring someone to take the minutes for the planning board. He feels the minutes are one of the most important documents it's generated in a meeting. Minutes are the task. Minutes are the task the board is going to work on and do which and who will do which task. He expressed concern about minutes taking and distributed in an acceptable and timely fashion as he does not feel the planning board does this. He is dissatisfied with how the minutes are taken and distributed. He explained that his opinion, the minutes, in, minutes include the board's action items. And that if we don't have that list coming out for months after a meeting, you're doomed to get things done. Waiting two months for minutes, action items, list to see who was supposed to do something two months ago is not acceptable. Okay, and then, Deb stated that no other committees have that level of clerical support and the duties and responsibilities come with being a board member. Mail, for example, is a responsibility to chair. When it comes to minutes, Deb stated that in her opinion, Mike did not give Sun He guidance on his expectations to the concerns and expectations, whether this was Sun He will have a clear idea of Mike's expectations, she can deliver them. Tonight was the first time Mike discussed the creation of an action item list with the board. This list is not the same as minutes and would, while it could can be included in the minutes, is different and separated from the minutes taking. If Mike wants this specific list created, then he needs to let Sun He know he expects this, expects this and it falls under her responsibility. In her opinion, Deb doesn't feel the Finance Committee would support a clerical position for just one board. The Planning Board is a stipend board and that comes with duties and responsibilities and members are expected to do. So we take I, I took that off the table after that. Brian explained the town is filing ANR for Pleasant Street layout. There's no land taking, looking at the layout from 8, 19, August of 1903, the entire road was known as Pleasant Streets. Somehow during the last hundred years, an arrow is made and the small section was incorrectly labeled Maple Street. This A and R would incorporate Maple Street into Ple Pleasant Street as the select board of 1903 intended. There's no address on this road and it will not affect 911. A motion was made by Mike and seconded by Janice to unanimously approve the ANR for Pleasant Street. We passed over ADU's uh, review and revisions. Um, other business not, oh, Brian should receive paperwork sometime this week, hopefully, once received, we'll execute and send back. Once this 
signed and sent back that we can proceed with finding as a consultant. So we it was was it a sixty thousand dollar grant, Mariah? You got I think for that. That sounds right. Yes. So so hopefully we can get a consultant to help go through all our planning stuff. Other business not anticipated, Deb pointed out at the budget hearing that the planning board needs to complete their part of the codification project. Could this please be included on the January agenda? Mike, yes, it will be. Other business not anticipated, Deb asked Mike if he has concerns or problems with how people are working on the board that he addresses them with a the board so they can, can be resolved, not left to, left to fester. She felt that it was unfair to Sunhe that was in present during a discussion that focused on her work on the board. In the approximately eight months she has been taking our minutes, no concerns have been addressed with the board so far. To hear them tonight was surprising. And I respond that this is why you requested more help. Deb explained that she understands this. However, as board members, we have responsibility comes with serving and we can't just hire someone to do them and that no other boards has that level of support. We are not willing to take these on. Maybe we need to rethink why we're here. Mike stated he feels he's doing more than our previous chair, that meetings were not held for a year prior to him becoming chair and he has held one every month. This is hard to have an effective meeting when you don't have action items and minutes. So he is aware and he isn't happy and he wants some minutes on out a week after the meeting and that he stated that many times and that it hasn't happened. Deb expressed that having taken minutes for six years, accepting them out of in a week is unrealistic and is holding us to a standard that is set by a prior generation of planning board and that it's unfair. Mike stated that maybe it was. I've taken the site plans off the board and the special permit off the board. We got too much on our table right now. A motion was made by Mike and seconded by Janice. The planning voted unanimously to adjourn at 9.20. Next meeting will be held on January 20th at 7 p.m. Thank you, Deb. I, I, I make a motion to accept the minutes as amended. Oh, okay. Can't hear you. Sorry, I was muted and lost my cursor. I caught a mistake. Um, it was actually Dick Newton that pointed out that the codification needed to be worked on, not me. Okay. Okay, now you can make your motion. <laughs> Sorry. I'll make, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes oh, as amended. Funny. As amended, okay. And I'll second. Okay, please uh, do a roll call, all in favor. All in favor? No, well, no, or I mean- You can say your name, right? So it'd be like, um, uh, Sunny, I. Deb, I. Mike Schaefer, I. It's unanimously approved. Okay, thank you. That was a very detailed uh, <laughs> minutes. Okay, the new mail, uh, there hasn't, wasn't too much there. One thing, Brian, maybe you could help me. I got a thing from FERCOG that said that uh, Irving had requested to take over Poplar Mountain develop, road development from them. I didn't quite follow that. that. Do, you, do you know what I'm talking about, Brian? Uh, Mariah, I don't know. It, it's uh, a. There was a Zoom meet, an MGL meeting on January thirteenth. Um, the public con convenience and necessity to require the discontinuance of all existing Franklin County layouts along Poplar Mountain Road in the town of Irving such that upon discontinuance as a county road, it shall become a town road in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 82, section five. 
any any updates i don't mariah do you know i don't know anything about it i i don't know what the question is i don't even understand what it, it's it had to it was from franklin county to Ir, the town of irving about poplar mountain um it was a so it was yeah a public so are you asking what that process is yeah i don't yeah what what is that pro what is that process what's it about so yep. right now poplar mountain road is uh is a county road the layout is run by the county and um the town is taking it from them to have it be a town road and did that go through do you know if that's is, is that all done now I believe, I believe so that that's correct they had their public hearing last week and they voted to support the town's application so we are working with a surveyor as soon as the surveyor is done with the layout the select board will send it to the planning board for an a &R. once that's done the select board will hold the public hearing on it and assuming there's no concerns, we'll order the layout and take it to town meeting. Okay, thank you, Brian. Of course. And uh, we had a few ZBAs from Gill uh, about a wireless communication. I guess they put in North um, Mount North well, Northfield Mount Herman. They put they set up a wireless communication building. Um, and they had a non-conforming lot for a, a resident in Montague. So that's really all I, I've got for new mail. Um, we did get a letter of interest from Melanie uh, Burnett too uh, that Brian, Brian received from her. So uh, I don't know if I've got that on the agenda or not. I don't think I do um okay so the the next item was status of anr's uh town of irving and swamp road so i know the swamp road for the burnett's got approved and it jackie delivered it to him uh mark so that one's done brian i how are you doing with the anr's are you okay with the town anr's or is it still things that we need to approve. So you had approved the four road layouts that we've taken to to you all this year. Um, there was a slight mistake when the town clerk was signing them in and I think he, he put the wrong date on there. Um, so he was gonna ask if you wouldn't mind just re-signing the Mylar uh, with the, the date you already approved it. You've already, there are no changes, uh, but it's just to, to correct that one clerical mistake. Um, so those are finally in town hall and I can put those out for your signature the next time you all come through. Um, the okay. only one that I haven't brought to you yet is the one for Poplar Mountain and that's because we're, we're still in the drafting stage. Um, but otherwise, yes, you, you've taken care of all of them for us. So well, they, well, why don't you send an email out when they're ready to be signed? And of course. Can, uh, all right. Of course. And I'll even, right. uh, if it's helpful, I'll, I'll put the new Mylar with the one you signed before, so you'll see exactly that it's it, nothing's different. Right, right. And um, good, thank you. Yep. And the next thing, Ryan, I I wondered maybe you um, could lead lead us on um, review public hearing zoning change and table and definition multiple unit maximum four to no max allowed by special permit, two zones, Central Village and Village Residential by select boards. I'll even jump on camera, so I'm not a, a mysterious voice. Um, so the select board considered the feedback that they received from your December 16th public hearing and uh, participation from the public at a subsequent select board meeting i believe that was january 3rd and so they've prepared this memorandum for you all <clears throat> they they are um, changing their request after that feedback 
Um, they still believe that the definition request that they asked for in terms of the uh, removal of a cap on the multi-unit and the change from family to unit is still um, still necessary, so they would like to maintain that request. Uh, but they are reducing the request to have um, it allowed by special permit in all zones, and instead they're just asking uh, that the planning board hold a public hearing to consider adding it to VR. It's already in CV, so it would just be adding it to the VR section. Any other discussion, Deb? Were you able to look at other towns at what they they did or at all on that? No, I looked at. I mean, I reviewed the documents that Brian sent. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to look at other towns. Um, I know this new memo that they sent. Personally, I'm comfortable with. I I had a chance to look at one town that i thought had a a good solution and uh shelburne i think you said yeah i don't know if is this it dwelling yeah uh and what they had at it would be 2.15 it wouldn't be multiple family it would be multiple units it, a principal building designed for or converted for occupancy by up to four families living in i guess you wouldn't say families for um in separate dwelling units separated by vertical walls or horizontal walls this is what i like though it said historic industrial or commercial structures converted for multiple family residence use may have more than not nine dwelling units i don't know why they have put nine in there <laughs> but, um so what they're saying is new construction would be limited to four units but if you were taking a factory or a school you could have as many units in there as would be practical right that's what i i, I don't know any discussion on that What I it would it would meet your requirements. Really, your the the select board. I believe they they want to convert the the old school and the IP mill into uh, you know housing units, and right. those would both I would think would fall if we put it into use something. Historic was before 1950. I think was their definition of historic. How old is the school building there, Brian? Is 1924. that 1924? Yeah. The, so I, I, I obviously can't speak for the select board. I, I I think that that may address some of what I heard them talk about, but I would have to bring that recommendation back to them to, to see if they concur. I'm yeah. kind of on. Oh, go ahead, Deb. Sorry. I was going to say, I like this idea. I like the idea of reuse. Um, my only concern with this, A, what happens if you want five, six, seven, or eight apartments? I don't see anywhere they cover those numbers. Um, but I think of things like senior housing, that more than likely would be brand new development. True. And are we eliminating that perspective type of development by implementing something like this? Well, what I you could write in, well, the a planned unit development would be excluded from it too. If that's going to be that's, I thought about that, and that would be my answer to that. You know, we could include planned unit developments in this. Hmm. Good point. My other thing that I'm concerned about is not including the French King in it. Well, and a and a pod isn't always um, isn't always strictly residential, so I don't know if having it written like that would make sense. If I can offer, I think that 
um, you could you could say something like that in you would phrase it in a way that you know if the residential development is part of the PUD then it would be exempt from this you know um, not not that all PUDs would be subject to the residential restriction but almost the opposite of, of if the dwelling units are in the PUD then you can have more than four units or something like that right that's kind of i mean that's the kind of the wording i would i would think would be good if you you know i thought of that Deb, and that was you know one of my concerns about the elderly housing um and then like i said the other thing i would i don't see why we're not including the french king commercial in it too because it is commercial compared to village residential well and i would just throw this out here what happens if our pud doesn't go through um you know if the residents don't support the pud then we're kind of back at square one well i, I would put the pud through quick you know i th i don't you know like the order that you do things in was important so the pud sh we should get that approved as quickly as we can um uh, the senior housing isn't even on the table right now no it's not but i just don't know if i like the idea of tying multi-unit development to a district that has not been formally created um i just well, i don't this know would go at the same time as the hud right i mean this would be a one of the things we're going to bring to special meeting so you'd have to if the pud doesn't get created i see what you're saying this you couldn't include it in it afterwards right i guess for me i would rather see us address the use table and the definition i like where shelburne is going with the idea of kind of requiring reuse i don't necessarily know if i feel it fits as well in irving i mean i can only really think of three maybe four spots that that would be you know a property would be able to be reused um but I think we have plenty of land where if someone wanted to work with the town in a, in a development setting, something new could be built. Requiring reuse, my other concern with that is the cost. I mean, the, the cost can be so exorbitantly expensive. The library to reuse the Union 28 building, I think was a 10 or $11 million project. Um, and that was literally gutting the entire thing and just leaving the shell and building up from there. So that isn't, I would be fearful in that regard that someone would come in and look at a property we want to have reused and just say, you know what, that building needs so much work to bring it even up to code. It's just not a cost, a product we can afford to, to take on. And so then we're just gonna get stuck having this big mill or whatever it is sitting there again, not being used because it's too cost prohibitive. I have seen a lot of other mills in this Route 2 corridor up and down, that, like the old factories and things like that, that have been reused, re what whatnot. I don't know if there are, I don't know what's out there for like special construction, special grants or something like that, that could help with the co those kinds of costs. But I don't know if, or, you know, um, private companies are, are, had the money to do it or whatnot, but, there, you know, people have reused buildings, definitely, right? So, and we have seen that, and they, they've turned them into office buildings or, or office spaces or dwellings or, um, you know, art spaces, let's say Mass Mocha, for example, in North Adams and the Berkshires. Um, th those all have been paper factories, textile factories, and they're reused, you know? Um, yeah, so it's either reuse or demolish and then, you know, use the pad, the foot pad, right? Is that how it goes in this town? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I don't know if there are like grants to, um, you know, help 
uh, gut old, you know, buildings or companies or, you know, just buildings, I suppose, um, out there in Massachusetts or federally or anything like that. That's just a thought. Just if you would like, in general, I think the mix, um, there's a variety of factors for how that mix works on you. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The, the potential exists and it really is finding the right developer with the right financial portfolio and opportunities, clients that they're working with. And then it really comes down to the site location and the, um, the ability of the town, whether it's through the zoning bylaws or the development package that the, the town's willing to work with a potential developer, it, it, it's a multitude of factors. And so, you know, what you all are describing right here and discussing is just one piece of that, that overall puzzle. Um, you, you're trying to put together as many tools in the toolbox that allows the community to achieve what it's trying to achieve. And hopefully that, that array of options is uh, attractive enough to a potential developer where they're willing to take that financial risk. You're absolutely right. It, it could be a commercial space. It could be artist studios. It could be uh, housing units, who, who knows? Um, and, and we've definitely seen uh, examples of success. Um, the, the concern though is if you allow, um, if, if you don't create some opportunity for these non, these facilities that don't comply with our laws, um, they will sit, they will rot. And at some point they do become a, a greater liability on the community. So we, we risk not timing these opportunities correctly. And I think you're in a, in a, point where right now we have a lot of expressed interest who knows who the, the successful project proposer will be but right now you have a lot of people expressing interest in these facilities um, so this could be a good opportunity for you all to achieve some goals so Janice what are your thoughts are you I think it like should we just be put a big old for a lease sign up <laughs> i know i'm just like listening to everything you guys are saying and gals and i'm a little floored right now like you know oh my gosh there's a lot to uh think about like deb was saying you know and mike about the uh housing for the elderly and then god i don't know <laughs> it's a tough call because you know i want to get old and maybe go into that new development but you know <laughs> well i'm going there cool. next week so. <laughs> we want you all to be able to stay here in irving until the day you no longer want to be here so if that means decades we want to make sure we have housing for you all okay brian thank you <laughs> i i guess i'm concerned about taking the maximum with no maximum listed without doing something like what I, you know, if we can phrase it so that we can make, make it so that um, these two buildings can be utilized soon, that would be good. And then maybe later we can rewrite the, uh, rewrite it to address the, um, the senior housing, but I don't know how to put, I don't, know how to do it um without i don't know what maximum number we should put on there right now that's my problem uh, we've we've heard about 50 at the ip mill and maybe 10 at the the, the school um i i learned something the other day that might be helpful in this conversation um uh, I went to a webinar on 40B, and I believe Deb did as well, um, as well as one of our select board members. And after that, I was doing some research on how 40B works, how comprehensive permitting, you know, what, how does it actually function and what are the logistics of it? And one of the things that I learned, so um, I, I guess I don't know if everyone knows what 40B is, but I'll explain just in case. So um, chapter 40B allows comprehensive permitting, which is permitting um, for development projects that are for affordable housing, which exceed zoning requirements. 
So for example, our current zoning allows up to four units. So if someone came in with an affordable housing development proposal for eight units, they would be doing that through a comprehensive permit under chapter 40B. Um, and basically they're, they're appealing our zoning standards and saying that it's for the greater good of having affordable housing in that community. And there are several things that a town can do if that happens and they feel that that project is not a good fit. Um, if they feel it's a good fit, they can say, great, we'll work with you to make this comprehensive permit happen. You know, you're good to go. That's called a friendly 40B. Um, if people in town feel like that is not a good fit or there's adjustments that need to be made, um, they can work on those adjustments with the developer potentially. Um, if they want to try to outright not have that development, there are uh, parameters on that. And that's when Brian talks about 10% subsidized housing. Um, if you have that 10%, that allows you to say, actually, we've met this threshold. We, we are going to stand by our zoning requirements. Um, so that's one way. A housing production plan, putting that in place is another way. Um, but the thing that I learned that I think is more, most pertinent to this is that a, a zoning board of appeals can say, um, can, can I believe lawfully reject a comprehensive permit application if the proposed housing units are more than 6% of the current units in town. Um, so for example, say Irving has 700 housing units and a proposer comes in and says, I'm gonna build 700 housing units, you know, and that's 100% of our current housing stock, the Zoning Board of Appeals could say no to that. So my understanding is that I think six, I think I calculated it in 6% of our current number of housing units was about 40 units. So if someone, if a developer came in and tried to file a comprehensive permit under chapter 40B, the Zoning Board of Appeals could make them limit it to 40 units, is my understanding. So that might provide some context to this conversation. I, I think that your discussion about having an upward limit on the number of dwellings is a, a totally valid conversation um, because it will apply to more than just 40B. Um, but that might give you an idea when we're talking about the specific properties that we're expecting a 40B to potentially happen, but those are some of the parameters that they have. Do you know, like Jackie said, Sunderland, that was a 40B project down there. They put in 150 units. Are you guys familiar with that? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, kind of. I saw part of it. I know it was a very contentious and it went all the way to the, I believe it's the state Supreme Court and the developer won because the town did not want it. Um, and I, I would went, hate to see I that looked happen. at it yesterday, I drove by and I, it didn't look very good to me. I mean, it, it's, it's six, five or six big buildings, barrack style, three floors with a hundred, probably 30 units in a, a building. And uh, I don't know, it, it wouldn't, I don't, I didn't think it looked that great to be truthful but that's my opinion <laughs> well i think that just goes back to the uh, the bylaw that you're crafting is trying to give again the 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 tools to you all to try to control the type of development you want to see i mean we can't control every aspect but the things that are really important to you all to keep the character and the 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 um the values of the community you know intact in so you know it, it, I think we bring this to you, this request, the select boards bring this request to you, yes, because we have projects that we're trying to see to fruition, but um, but hoping that as you go through this process, we're creating tools for you all to keep what's important to Irving viable, you know. Nobody's trying to cram a, a project through that doesn't reflect the character of the, of the uh, needs of the community. Um, so can I simplify, uh, Mariah, um, Chapter 40B as comprehensive permit for a, affordable housing? Yes, that's that's what it's for. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just say I'm not in favor of a cap. I have given it a lot of thought. And I think at some point, I think um, Scott made an interesting point at the select board meeting that if we cap it and a developer came forward and let's say we capped village residential at 10 and a developer came forward with a plan with 15 units, but it had everything we ever could have wanted. We now, in theory, can't work with them unless they do a 40B process. So I think at some point, we have to say we trust ourselves as elected officials. We trust the Board of Selectmen as elected officials. And we trust the process to make the best decisions that are in the best interest of our community. I mean, it's not, there is tons. I was actually really surprised when I went to the 40B seminar when they first kind of just spoke about the review process and how long it could take, I was kind of like, oh, that doesn't really feel very long. And then he put the slide up on the screen and was like, it's the time to do this and this and this. And I was like, wow, that feels like a really, really long time. And all included in that are public hearings and you know all kinds of stuff. So there's plenty of opportunity for our community to have input and have say. And I just keep thinking back to what if we cap something, we're coming up with, we're just pulling out an arbitrary number. And so what if that actually, that cap ends up being detrimental and we miss out on really amazing projects because we came up with some arbitrary, what's the difference from 10 to 12? Are we gonna go with odd numbers or even numbers? Like I, I just, it, it feels like we're kind of pulling it out of a hat. And in all well, reality, if a developer came into 40B, they can pretty much build whatever, you know, in within reason, a number of units right now, because we have zero affordable housing. So a cap's not gonna matter in that instance. I got two questions. One is if, if we do set a cap at 10 and someone comes in and wants 15, they could go, I believe, through the ZBA and get a variance. Uh, am I wrong there? I don't know. The, the the ZBA variance process looks at, I believe it's five specific statutory characteristics, and it has to do with aspects of the land that they can't, there's some reason about the property that they can't comply with your zoning. So something beyond the applicant's control. So I don't think that housing unit numbers would be grounds for a variance. Okay. The chapter 40B process is, is basically a variance. If you think of it that way, it's just a very complicated variant. And it's that's overseen by DHCD on the state level. And that would, like Mariah said, roughly 40 unit maximum for 6% of our 700 homes. So there is a limit there. Yeah, I'm still not comfortable without a limit for new construction. Uh, I, I I would accept this one that I I said where you take an existing structure and convert it, take the limit off. But I don't know if you want us to take a vote, Brian. I no, I think I think what Jake was asking you all is either for feedback. I, in or not jake but uh, the select board was asking either for feedback from the planning board uh for the select board to consider further or to schedule the public hearing um so that a potential zoning change could be presented to the residents at town meeting so I, I don't know that you need to take any votes other than if you choose to but you don't right now the not all the planning board supports uh, supports it the way it's written. Right. So if there's feedback you'd like to send back to the select board, you the four of you could choose to do that. So yeah, well, I mean that's what I'm saying. Deb saying she doesn't want a max. I'm not happy without a max or using something like what I put in here. Brian, because the select board has changed their request, are we obligated to hold a public hearing regardless? Is it considered a new request now that they changed it? 
it is considered a new request. So we went back to council to uh, to ask for clarification on the feedback process, the planning uh, planning board's public hearing process, and whether a lesser request than the previous request triggers another public hearing. And her uh, her guidance on that matter is that it would be uh, necessary to hold a separate public hearing even if the change that the select board is now requesting is less than what they asked you before. Um, so any change of substance uh, requires that public hearing process. I guess so what I would say to that is you could schedule a public hearing based on what the request is, um, but if you all have as a planning board a different opinion on what you wanna see there, scheduling public hearing after public hearing for the sake of a public hearing, if there's no agreement between the boards, may not be the most efficient use of all of our time. Um, or the public's, you know, at some point the public's probably gonna get a little tiresome of all of these public hearings. So it, we probably wanna make sure that there's some general consensus um, before you schedule that public hearing. Would you like me to see if I can get a select board member to jump on to, to talk to you all? Sure. Let me see if Jake's available. I think he's going to be joining us in just a minute. Do you know if all those apartments are affordable housing for 40B or is it, or does just a certain percentage of it have to be Mariah or Deb? It's sorry. It, it's a percentage. And that, and that really Mike is dictated by many, many factors, but one driving factor is the financial mix that a developer is going to bring to the table. So if they're trying to do a project and it's necessary to have certain a certain number of units at a particular um, subsidized rate, they're doing that because the guaranteed from the federal government in terms of the subsidies that they'll receive allows them to fund the project. So uh, you, you could have a, a mix of a market, just above market, 80% AMI, 30% AMI, and that mix allows them to actually fund the project. Whereas another developer may have a completely different financial capacity and they could do all uh, full market rate. Um, so it really depends on the, the developer and, and what their financial portfolio looks like. I'm not sure if he's been able to jump on yet. There we go.
And I'll be right back. I just need to drag my dog into another room. Hold on. <laughs> All right. So, Mike, just to give you an idea, the one in Sunderland, I just looked up the article, 150 units and only 25% are deemed affordable. Everything else is market. That's a pretty high percentage, though. Usually it's like 10 or 20%. So. Um, I think if you have questions for the select board member, you should ask them. Did you have specific questions for him, Mike, or I'm, I don't, I don't know if Sonny or Janice might. No, I mean, I, my thing was, I won't want to set a maximum number of units unless we use existing buildings to get this through quickly so you can move on bring it to a special hearing public hearing public i think jake's just having a mic issue can you hear me there we go yeah, got you okay. now, Jay. Okay, I said that a few times and got no response. So it must have been something on my end. Uh, sorry about that. I, I am here now. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think uh, I was trying to respond back to the planning board's questions regarding the request that the select board submitted. And I think they're trying to figure out how they are going to proceed. Um, so if, if there's maybe some feedback as a select board member uh, about what you were looking for, um, maybe that would help the, the planning board move forward. Um, sure, I am not sure if there was anything in the memo that drove any questions that wasn't clear, um, you know, the board, there's a couple of projects specifically that we're working on, and one is the um, 18 Pleasant Street former graded school. And the board in their RFP out to potential um, interested developers was, you know, intentional in writing a grading rubric that focused on, uh, you know, more advantageous to have housing. Um, at the time oversight on on our part in the office and ourselves to not realize it was in <clears throat> vr which doesn't allow that type of development um, so that was kind of the first driver for requesting review of this and recommending you know that the, the planning board consider either changing the zoning originally was a, was one thought in that area but, but maybe a better approach was to change to special permit and to adjust the language and the definition for multi unit and to make it you know greater than than four. Um, secondary to that, we're working on the former IP mill property, which obviously is much larger. And some of the proposals over the years and, and studies we've done have uh, indicated it may lend itself to mixed use, which would include residential and likely anything that did include residential in that site would be greater than four units. So again, even though that is uh, CV and does allow multi unit by special permit currently, I believe it yep. would again be capped at four and, and that wouldn't be conducive to that size, you know, size location if a developer was interested in putting in some mixed use that included housing. So, so it's like words, you know, request was to consider um, potentially moving VR to the special permit, you know, after knowing the planning board stayed there or um, 
held over the request that we had last time. It was a little more broad and uh, wanted to, you know, review it further before providing feedback. Uh, we kind of reconsidered as well and said, you know, there's there's really a couple specific areas that we're focused on and some of the other areas that don't have it currently may or may not be conducive to changing the multi-unit development allowance to special permit. And so the select board didn't feel like they want to take a stance on that, but but to instead narrow the scope, which was the point of this memo. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. I, I I can speak for myself, Jake. I don't not as a board, but I've got two concerns. One is I think the French King commercial should be included in it, not excluded. And the uh, the number of units per per building should be capped. Or I I Brian put up if you could show Brian the other from Shelburne again, just so Jake has, sees it. But well, I think Brian was. One thing I found in Shelburne under 2.15, um, a, a multi-unit building, a principal building designed or converted for occupancy of up to four families, including living space, separated vertical walls and horizontal. Historic industrial or commercial structures, which for them is before 1950, converted for multiple family residential use, may have more than nine dwelling units. I don't know, but it could have any number of units um, and also see parking requirements. But specifically for the two buildings that you're looking at, this would address it without putting a upper limit on, which we, we're like Deb said, we're guessing a, a number if we're trying to put 50 or 10 or 12. Um, but this would, I'm not, ha I, I, I'm not happy without some kind of upper unit number on it without using an existing building. Uh, I'm by far not a zoning expert, so it's a question for all of you, but if it's by special permit, doesn't that give the review process the ability to restrict the number of units when they see the proposal if they feel it doesn't fit the area that, that's being proposed if there's good reason obviously you know I, i'm assuming it requires you know good reason and consistency but if is that accurate i think that's putting a lot of pressure on the planning board because that, that's my opinion it should i think it should be if it's in the the bylaw then it, it's easy to enforce, but it, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be hard for the planning board. That's that's my issue. I guess I don't I don't follow the difficulty. There's a special permit process where they have to present the you know present their proposal and and probably reasons why they want that unit count if it's you know, larger, and I don't know how we would come up with an arbitrary limit today that says we can imagine what a specific area can or cannot handle without seeing a plan and knowing the neighborhood and, and all of those factors that go into that. Again, that's we have a, my opinion, a four now. Somebody came up with that limit and. Uh, um, I, I personally, I six would be okay. I, you know, a building with six units I've seen that look nice, but bigger than that, I don't think fits into Irving. So I think it's important to point out, and I don't, I know this got pointed out before, and I, my apologies if it was here. Um, I've attended a couple different meetings where this topic's been discussed. I think people have the misconception that if we change and we remove a cap that suddenly every single property becomes available for this type of building and that's not true because it still has to fit all the other zoning requirements for that district um i'll be honest i believe in a really open and 
you know, I, I want residents to look at our meetings and, and feel like we're doing things on the up and up and accepting 2.15 so we can get these two projects through, so to speak, feels sneaky to me. And it doesn't, it doesn't sit well with me to make the decision based on the potential for redevelopment at two sites and then to go back knowing that we're going to go back and, re and, and revisit it and change it. Um, so I think if we are going to make a change, we should make a change that is suitable for the town as a whole, not specific to two sites right now. I mean, we have two sites that are be being developed, you know, that there's interest in right now. As Brian said, we could get RFPs back and we could get none. You know, I, I hope that's not the case. I hope I didn't just put out some bad energy into the universe. Um, but I think we have to look at it much more holistically than just two specific sites, because this change will affect the entire community. Um, and and I don't think it should go to special, it needs to go to town meeting if you want to do that. That's what Mark said. I mean, if you don't want to be sneaky about it, don't put it through at a special meeting. So putting it through at a special town meeting, in my opinion, is not sneaky. Um, we send po we send postcards home notifying everyone that we are holding our public hearings. The special town meeting warrant goes to every home in our community. It's put on the Facebook page. It's put on the town website. Um, they're posted at the library. They're posted at town hall. And for the last 15 years, as Brian pointed out, our zoning changes have been done at special town meetings. So that's not being sneaky. And as a resident, it's my responsibility if there's an issue that I care about and that I feel you know I have an opinion about, it's on me to get myself to that meeting, regardless of when it's held. So I, I, I said to Mark then, I disagree with that theory. Um, I have witnessed many times where things have come to an annual town meeting and as soon as that specific interest group the article is passed, they're up and out the door. I have seen where we have agonized over how to how to organize the warrant. So certain things come in certain orders. And I've watched, I'm not trying to call them out, but they're the group that did it. The school committee stand up and request that all the school meeting warrants be moved to the front of the agenda. And then again, they were voted on and there was mass exodus. I have watched our town clerk have to get up and count at an annual town meeting to make sure we still held quorum. So there's no guarantee people are going to show up at either. Um, and so I honestly, Mike, I take a little offense to you calling so it sneaky. I'm not the only one who said that, Deb. I was at a, a select board meeting and Scott said that too. And uh, Mark said it at the last public hearing meeting. So I'm, I'm just. Yeah, I was there. I was, I was at the, I've been at the board meetings because of my finance committee obligations. Um, Scott also said that because after hearing that it had been done for the last 15 years that way, Brian, please correct me if I'm wrong, it was a bit of a lesser concern to him to have it done that way. Because we are able to historically show that's how we've always done it. Um, that and the, the fact that the existing board has made a commitment over the last several years that every warrant is mailed to every household. So everybody has time with the document. They don't have to seek it out. It's, it's brought to them. Um, I don't know, shy of sitting with them and reading it to them, there's there's few other steps I think the town could reasonably take to make sure that every resident had the opportunity to be informed. Um, at that stage, you're coming down to scheduling conflicts and, and truly voter interest. And, and those are things that the day of the, the year has little impact on. Um, so I think from that standpoint, the select board felt it, if as if we've given as much due notice to the residents and have literally provided them with a printed copy in their hands in places, as you noted, to, to get it electronically if they needed it, that, that's about all a town can do to duly warn and, and attempt to engage. But I, I do think just to be clear uh, to what you just said, Deb, none of these requests that the, the select board's recommending or, or the things that you've been working on with Mariah for the last year, None of these were meant to drive a project in, in town. The, the reality is we think that there's some common sense steps that the town can take to address some, um, some constraints or some, some other limitations within our zoning 
to hopefully create opportunity throughout the town. There's no interest in trying to um, get one project through and, and alter the zoning, as you noted, and, and then quickly present a, a change to, to put a restriction back in place. Um, and I know that when this conversation came up, and I know that, that Mike, you've expressed a concern about the discretion or the, the pressure on the planning board, the way it was presented from the, the select board, and, and Jake can correct me if I'm misspeaking, was that there's a trust in the planning board to do uh, the, the special permit process in a manner that is is responsible and ethical and, and obviously comports with law, and that they trusted the discretion of the planning board to see that process through. Um, and, and so they didn't feel like they needed to give you a cap to work under because they trusted you all to do that. Um, so, so it definitely was not to put additional pressure on you. It was to say we, they deferred to your your knowledge on this and your your decision making. Um, am I misconstruing that, Jake? No, that, that's accurate. And we um, we believe that it does need review. And in at least in my opinion, obviously, I'm speaking mostly on my behalf and and what the board. Has already set out in public. I'm not presuming to know, you know, every um, detail that each of the board members feels, but generally that we felt it's something that does deserve review when it's larger. Hence, it, uh, it should be special permit as opposed to by right in any zone that that we or district that we put it in. And if to what you said earlier, Mike, the planning board feels that it should be in another district or zone, then that's definitely for, for you to propose um, as the planning board. That's that's why we deferred to your expertise, asked, asked the question, asked for the cons to consider this, um, but didn't assume to know the, the best solution. Um, and the two projects that I mentioned brought the the restriction and, and maybe the limit to, to light, but I know for many years that conversation has been had that the zoning is very specific, that it can only be three to four units in a multifamily and things like that. That is not something new. Um, and I'm sure it had a purpose, but, but we also understand that we have 0% affordable housing and we have a lot of, you know, there's, there's literally no property or housing available at most times of the year in Irving. And so it limits the ability for the town to grow. And you know, we need to, I, I at least believe as a board member that we need to be looking at how do we continue to grow and develop and, and keep Irving relevant and, and engaged and, and keep people engaged in it because otherwise, you know, our tax base and everything else will continue to dwindle. And, and uh, that's not good for the overall town's health. And I agree, Mike, we need strong bylaws. But I also don't think we still have to do our jobs. So, I mean, whether that's going to put pressure on us or not, that kind of comes with the territory. So, I mean, I, I totally agree. I wanna see bylaws that are written well and bylaws that are written that benefit our community, but I'm also not afraid to dig in and do the work if we have to. Um, you know, that's where we can hire. In fact, it was one of the things discussed during the 40B seminar about getting your consultants and getting those outside people that are coming in to help you with a project on board as quickly as you can once the application has been received. So it does help to take some of the, board, the burden off the boards that are working on those projects. Um, you know, so I don't think we can be afraid of doing our jobs as the board. Anybody else have anything? I have to agree with Deb because I mean, it's like uh, basically we just opened up a can of worms right here, so to speak, that now we're looking at a bigger picture because of these two buildings. And, you know, it's, it's a tough decision. And, you know, Jake, you may, I don't know, to me, it's just really hard because 
you know, we live out in the country and I understand, you know, we need affordable housing. It's a lot to, to take in right now. It is. Is there, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I looked at Shelburne. I didn't look at other towns, but I'd like to maybe look at a couple others and see if what they have for limits. I'm, I'm, I thought they addressed it pretty well here by at least it would be a way out to use the two buildings you want to do. And uh, I don't know. Maybe I should just clarify a little bit. These brought up the, the question and raised concern about what's there now for, for the board or, or consideration to, to ask the question. Um, we're not looking for zoning that just fits two buildings. If we want to get around zoning for two buildings, we'll do a 40B process and let a developer come in and avoid it all. I mean, that's just to be frank, that's that's my opinion. We can do that. Um, so I, I just want to be clear that while those brought, those drove us to consider and review what's in here, by no means are we expecting uh, whatever decision the planning board makes to be specific or relative to two buildings. We're looking as the select board for the planning board to review how those definitions and the permit table affects the ability of a variety of parcels and existing or potential building lots uh, and, and what someone could or could not do with those. Um, you know, your point about French King was a good one. I mean, there's already a, it might not be considered, it's not residential, but there's already a multi-unit facility in that zone. And um, so, you know, and, and I understand, I guess what you're saying about this, uh, it doesn't have a cap, so I don't know how it meet, met that concern you had. And I guess it doesn't allow anything between five and eight units as I read it, which seems kind of odd, no matter where it is. And it almost seems to encourage someone to create something commercial industrial and then change it later if they don't like the zoning in that area, which- It has to be from prior to 1950, uh, the building historic in this case. Um, oh, that's not separate. I, I can't tell in this language. So that's historic industrial or historic commercial. It's not just yeah, any yeah. one of the three. Right. No, it says historic industrial or commercial structures. So I, I, that's how I took it. Was it was something before 1950, either a commercial or an industrial structure probably like a department store or a factory. Does it be interesting to find the definition of historic because- It's further down in here, down, um, if you go down to the bottom. Uh, from where oh, I, so they have their own definition, got it. Is there one per commercial structure, Mariah? I think Brian, you were getting at what I saw, which was, I'm sorry, that uh, historic was a prefix on industrial, not necessarily on commercial, so. Right. Uh, well, Mariah, scrolling, I kind of have a technical question. So we're, you know, just to throw it out there, the IP mill has structures that were built post 1950. So I would say like, I believe that whole front edition is post 1950. So how does something like that get handled? Interesting question. The be well that I thought that was being taken off the building, but the front part. Of it. I, I think it would be based off. Sorry, Brian, I interrupted you. I was just saying we assume that, but we don't know. Oh, I was going to say I, my assumption is that it would be based off of the um, like predominant structure. I don't know what language would be put in around that, but. If the main building is pre-1950, but there's accessory buildings or additions that are post-1950, that would, um, it would probably be the whole structure, but you would want at least a portion of it to have been from pre-1950. It's 
So I, I, I appreciate Jake, you being on here, but I think what Brian was saying, how many public, we, we're gonna have to bring this to public hearing again, your revision and, and um, we don't wanna drag it out forever. So I, is that Brian, the process we should go through, right? To try to get, get where we wanna be. So I think so. There's there's two pieces to this. You you had a public hearing in December, and at this point, you all as a board decided to table providing feedback to the select board. So I I don't know what you all will choose to do in terms of closing out that last public hearing process. Uh, proactively, the select board has already submitted uh, a revised request, which you have in front of you, and that was based on what they heard from what was discussed at the planning board meeting and then subsequently what was discussed at their january 3rd meeting um so so yes they're basically asking you to consider having another public hearing on this request but they still haven't gotten the planning board's feedback from the first time um officially and so and it sounds like you all are having a, de a healthy debate on on this request so i don't know if if in any of these cases you're prepared to offer the select board guidance um from your perspectives can i just offer some context to that as well my understanding is that the the public hearing happened for the, the most recent uh changes proposed by the select board the select board could now choose to move that to a, a town meeting they've done their due diligence they could do that but they've come back with a second request the right. report from the planning board is a request from the select board as a um, it's an option for the planning board and i think that the, the select board my understanding is that they would prefer to have feedback from the planning board since they are the ones that held the public hearing um it's not a requirement um but that this new request would still be subject to i believe it's a 60-day rule of having a public hearing within 60 days the select board might be amenable if they get another if they get a report with feedback saying um you know we suggest this instead maybe they would put out a new request and, and uh retract this one but i just want to be clear that the planning board is not picking whether they hold a public hearing the public to add to what you're saying, Mariah, I think the only piece, and this sort of speaks to what I was trying to say earlier, we just want to make sure that we're not holding so many public hearings on variations of the same topic that our voters are are feeling sort of exacerbated by all of this communication, all of these nuanced changes, and, and now they're so disengaged in the process that when they come to town, town meeting, it, they're not sure what they're voting on. So if, if the planning board is going to offer feedback, I would maybe encourage you all to do that before a public hearing is scheduled so that if there is a revision to be considered by the select board that they submit that back to you timely. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure how to get that done, Brian. I I mean, I'll, I'd like to do it tonight if we can, but I don't think we're going to reach consensus on, on it. Does it come down to something as easy as thinking about, do we want development to occur? How easy do we want development to occur? You know, how easy do we want it to make? it so that development is occurring or um can occur right do we want that old school building to be used redeveloped do we want the um international paper company to be you know uh taken and develop redeveloped right i mean how many barriers do we want to put up versus not too many barriers you know given that you, of course we're gonna um have to make sure that whoever does look at them you know they are soundproof and all that stuff with um finance and and uh you know go through the process right i mean that's what it sounds like to me
I agree, Sunny. It's that, and it's also how much control do we want to have over the process? Um, I, I guess my question, Mike, would be for you is, you said that you would be amenable to the Shelburne, the 2.15, but as Jake pointed out, that doesn't have a cap. So I guess I would ask, why are you in favor of doing it in that specific way with no cap versus allowing new building, a new construction with a cap? Like I, I said, I think a six unit new building would probably fit in okay. Anything bigger than that doesn't, I don't think fits in with Irving. That's my opinion. Not to be picky, but that wasn't really my question. I'm asking why you're okay with Shelburne's 2.15 not having a cap. Because it's taking an existing historic building and converting it to units, not take bringing building a new unit, a, a barrack style unit like they did in Sunderland. <clears throat> So aesthetically, it wouldn't look nice if they put in a 20-unit building in um, Village Central, right? But I don't I think don't, that, that I don't think that that would go through, though. You know? Well, and Why we not? would control that with the special permit I mean, process. I, I mean, it could maybe if you think that that would look nice. I mean, you want to make it look aesthetically pleasing, right? And that would fit in that neighborhood. And then there's all the residents that live there too, who will all also voice their opinions about it, right? Because you have to have a public hearing about it and things. Yes. So there are other, there are other, you know, pro through these processes, I think that at any point it can go through or whatnot, right? Right, because we would have the special permit process. So we would be in control. Just like, I don't know if you guys remember with the marijuana bylaw, um, at what point, it, at one point the bylaw said something about, um, I think it was a six foot tall or an eight foot tall chain link fence. And we all went, oh, that sounds so ugly. So we actually adjusted it to be, um, we gave the option to have shrubbery plantings and things like that for screenings um, instead, because we didn't want that, you know, big ugly chain link fence. And so we would have that control during the special permit process. And I guess to me, I don't personally see the difference of having no cap if they're reusing a building versus having a cap if they're building something new. I think to me, personally, to me, I, I don't, I just don't get the logic behind that, that they could take something like an existing mill building in town and build 300 units if they wanted to, but we wouldn't let them come in and build something new that they could make look to our standards at 300 units. So I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with trying to understand how that makes sense. I'm trying to not, I was on the planning board when the Dunkin' Donuts went in and it was a very tough special permitting process. And I don't want to put you guys through that for, a 20 unit building somewhere. Well, and I appreciate that, Mike. I, I came onto this board during a very contentious process. Um, so I get that. But I also know that that's the job we all sign up for. And, and we don't know what's going to be contentious. I can go to town meeting and I can think, you know, this article is going to pass no problem. And I'll think another article is going to be, quite frankly, I thought we were going to get a lot of resistance with the marijuana bylaw. And I was shocked at how easily that passed. You know, nobody batted an eyelash. Yes, woohoo, let's do it. Um, and I've seen conversation take 35, 40 minutes over raising dog licenses or, you know, kind of something that someone would look at and go, oh yeah, this totally makes sense. And and there is, you know, and people are, are, are upset about that. So I think we can do our best to try and gauge what's going to be tough but in in reality we just don't know I, i'd also like to just remind everybody that you're considering doing special permitting for the for the multi-unit housing so you would still be looking at special permits no matter what your cap is or isn't or if there isn't one 
unless you change that to being by right. No, I'm not saying that, but that's, I realize it's still special permit, but it'd be a lot easier if it was six units than 20 units trying to, to for me, anyhow, if I was, I, I like I said, I don't think a 20 unit building is going to fit into Central Village or Village Residential or French King very, very well. I guess I would counter Mike with there's already buildings like that there. I mean, there's two hotels in Central Village. Oh, I'm sorry, one in Central and one in, the, in French King. I mean, those are larger units. You know, those are Weatherheads is, I don't know the exact count. Looking at it, I would guess it's probably more than 20 units. Um, you know, so I, I guess they don't. And to me, Central Village is where we would want that kind of de development because that doesn't put it in our neighborhoods. I mean, I personally am against having something like this in rural residential. Personally, I feel it should be a no across the board. People who live in rural, rural residential bought big lots so that they had that sense of, I don't have neighbors. I have this nice, beautiful space to myself that I can enjoy. But I think there are places for it in our in the other three zones, and I think it it's not it's not like everybody and their brother is going to be able to just say, "Oh, woohoo! I've got a half acre of land. I'm throwing up 20 units." I mean, there's still a ton of other restrictions that they would have to go through, and I would bet in a lot of our districts we actually probably don't have that many lots that would actually accommodate this type of building. So I almost tend to wonder if we're as my mom would say, are we borrowing trouble? Are we thinking about things that actually can't happen because we just don't have the lot sizing and things like that that to allow it? Like Mariah always says, you can tear down a building and build something else on a lot too, so. But only if it conforms to the zoning. I can't tear down my house and put a 50 and put even probably a 10 unit development here even if I tore down my house, because I don't meet the zoning requirements. I would I would bet money on that, that my property would not accommodate that. So- No, some others may, I don't know. Anyhow, that's that's my concern. Uh, you've, you've, you've stated your, you know, what you, you think. Um, Mike, may I offer one additional comment? Yeah. I think kind of to what you brought up, Sunhe, I just want to put out there that another area that brought this topic forward for the select board is the 40B process. And I wasn't here for the earlier part of your meeting, so maybe you already discussed that potential. However, having at least a special permit in place um, would allow the planning board some oversight in what happens in may allow an avenue for a developer to go rather than potentially trying to exercise a 40B where we would have no say. And so we did want to look at ways that we could modernize our zoning that would encourage cooperation with developers and lessen the, the potential that someone may decide to, to go a 40B process because there are probably some properties that could support larger housing and they could bypass the zoning by going that route that are privately held, not just town properties, um, which was some of the input that we had at one of our last meetings, you know, the concerns about that. And, and I know some have brought that up as kind of, a, you know, is the, is the board fear mongering or something of that nature by bringing that topic up. And, and I, and I disagree adamantly. I think we all should be aware of the risks and, and make conscious decisions about whether or not we are enacting bylaws and regulations that allow us to try to have as much input and um, contribution to any changes that are happening in the town as we can. And if we aren't at least aware of those types of things and try to incorporate those potentials into decisions we make, then, you know, it's like uh, years ago when the um, public utility deregulated and they were considering sending all of the revenues from First Light, you know, the hydro facility uh, to back to the state level or, or other places. And, you know, a lot of the towns around, especially here, spent a ton of effort to ensure that that money stayed in Irving. And 
that could happen again. It's always a potential, you know, just like people talk about the hydro could close. A lot of things are going to change. It's going to be bad news. It could happen. We don't ignore that as a possibility just because it's, you know, it's going to be a monumental situation if it does. And I don't, uh, I don't envy some of those more difficult processes and the board's had many of those topics like, you know, you mentioned about Dunkin' Donuts. Um, there's been the gas station, there's been senior senior and community center. There's been so many over the years, even in the short time that we've lived here compared to some others. But I believe that that's what we were all elected to serve the citizens by doing is taking on those tough topics and ensuring that we try to provide you know, insight and oversight and guidance when those things are going to happen or trying to happen to ensure that they kind of fit the, the long-term view of what the town wants to be. And that's what we're tasked with. Thank you. Okay, so for tonight, is there anything that you want us to uh, say, Jacob, that you want to bring back to the select board? Like, are we supposed to approve something or say we're still thinking about it or something? <laughs> I, I think the, I think what the board is waiting on and hoping to hear, and I won't tell you what you all should do. That's for you to decide what you, you know, as a, as a majority feels the best choice uh, is to respond to the select board with either another recommendation what you feel should or shouldn't be changed and you know from no we don't agree with changing anything we're fine with the way it is all the way to you know we want it in all zones and we want it by right you know and i'm just being dramatic on either end of the scale but whatever the planning board may uh decide but i think what we'd like to hear is a, is a recommendation from the planning board on what they feel a change should be or that no change should be and then we can take action because we've gotten that feedback um, we narrowed our Kind of what we proposed because of what we heard for public feedback but we haven't heard anything yet officially from the planning board on what gotcha. you know, you all okay. believe we should do okay thanks mm -hmm. mike what do you think well we can we can take a vote if if you want on adding the french king and and take it let's i'll make a motion to recommend we include the French King in in the special permit process. Um, all in favor, can you wanna say if you're in favor or, or not for that? Mike, you need a second right. before you call that vote. Second. second, can someone second it? I'll second it, but I'm also gonna say, I'm not clear on what this vote is for. So I would like a better explanation. To include the French King commercial district in the select board, they they took it, they just included the um, central village and village residential and excluded French King commercial. So include that in the... Their request is only, their new request is only for village residential. Uh, Mariah just put it up on the screen for us. It's to add it in VR because it already exists in CV. Okay. So I think in, if I'm if I'm hearing Mike correctly, I think he's saying that he would like it to be he would like to recommend that VR and the French King District be changed to special permit. Correct. Thanks for the clarification, Mariah. You're welcome. Any seconds? I seconded. All in favor? Seconds. Uh, Sunhee, I. Um, so you're saying, can I just read this back? Mike makes the motion to make the French King District and the VR part of the special permit process? For multi unit developments, yeah. For multi unit developments. Yeah. 
continue not uh, could i could i suggest a friendly amendment your i believe your motion is to make the recommendation that the the select board add that back into their request is that correct correct And then I guess this is a take a I make a motion to take a vote on no cap on the number of units uh, for the multi unit for each of the three uh, sections. Hold on, can we can we start that? Can we have Sunhe read back the motion because I don't I didn't hear Janice vote and I didn't vote. And so okay. I think we're getting a little ahead. <laughs> so and, and a little yeah. bit, okay. Whoa, let me let me redo that. Um, let me re say that also. Mike makes the motion, and Mariah, you said to, um, no, no, it's late, and <laughs> so my brain's like swimming. Sorry. Um, Mike makes the motion to make the French King District and VR part of the special permit process for multi-unit multi-unit developments. I think you want it to be multi-unit dwellings. Multi-unit dwellings. 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 And I think in the beginning, you want to say Mike makes a motion to uh, in, something along the lines of like include in the report back to the select board. Uh, I don't know. Mike, you can put it in your own words, but this is not a motion to change the zoning. It's a motion to ask the select board to add this back in through your report. Sorry, Mariah, I, my kids were roughing, roughhousing over there and I totally didn't hear what you said. Um, and I'm like, I can't be there because I'm having a meeting. So <laughs> I'll be tasking. Um, Mike makes the motion to, makes the motion to include, sorry, Feedback to this is feedback to the select board. Mike makes the motion. Uh, Mike makes the motion to um, to give to give feedback to give feedback back back to the select board. to um to add the french king district the french king district and vr um hold on hold on one second let me try to redo this motion to makes the motion to give back to give makes motion to give feedback to the select board to approve the select board to change to change br French King District uh, to change we are French King District um, French King District to special permit permit all the unit dwellings. Is that correct? Dwellings, Mariah? Dwellings. Yeah, I think that's how you want to phrase it. Okay, so let's see. Mike makes the motion to give feedback to the select board to change VR and the French King District to special permit for multi-unit dwelling. Does that sound good? Yes. Is that right? Yes? Does that sound right? <laughs> Okay, and uh, Deb seconds. Yep. Okay. 
and I say Sunhi I. You want to roll call? Yeah, Mike Schaefer, I. Deb, I. Okay. And then the second uh, feedback, I'd like to make a motion to for the second feedback to the select board uh, regarding no cap on the number of units. Um, As as submitted, I guess. And do we get a second? I'll second. Okay. So this would be to go along with removing any cap on the number of units in each district. Um, all in favor? Sunhi so I. Sunhi so I. Okay. Deb I. And I'm gonna abstain, but it passes with majority. You still here, Jake, or? No. All right. Yes, I am. All right, so that, that would be the feedback from the planning board. Okay, uh, the select board is meeting again on the 7th, so we'll um, make sure it's on the agenda for the 7th and discuss uh, the feedback then and uh, if we, if the select board decides to um, incorporate the recommendations, then we'll, you know, we'll send that back. And uh, the, I don't know exactly when the clock would start on the 60 days for the public hearing, if it's from the original memo or the revisal, if we revise it. But, um, but then that clock will start for for the planning board to hold the public hearing on on the changes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Yeah, once I, I would just add, once we've provided the feedback, you know, you'll get that probably on the eighth. Um, if they're able to hold, uh, Brian, can you help me with the timeline? If they're able to schedule and plan a, a a hearing in time for us to actually include it in the special town meeting, or is that going to push our March timeline? If we wanted to get it on there, let's see. Yeah, it's going to push your timeline because we were hoping to close the STM, I think, on the 7th so that you could schedule a date and we could get ready to send it to the residents. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, so it may be too tight. Okay, all right. I was going to say, but either way, even if it's for the annual, um, just, you know, yep. as soon as you can get a hearing and uh, schedule would be great to keep to keep it moving. Thank I was you. Say, while, while you all were meeting, I uh, I just sent out the call to all of you for the annual town meeting warrant articles, so we can move these items over to the annual town meeting warrant. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Yeah, so I appreciate the feedback. We'll uh, we'll the board will review on their next meeting and and get you a response, and then uh, you know as soon as you can get a hearing scheduled, that would be great, so we can get it on to the annual. Okay. Thank you. Now back to the agenda. We're not very far along, and we're two hour over two hours into the meeting. Um, all right. This was the code modification. Uh, that's something I believe you wanted to try to get done prior to the annual meeting. Is that right, Brian? Or Sorry, I just realized I was muted. Uh, this project's been on hold for a while, and I think the uh, the town clerk realizes we don't have enough time to get this done for annual town meeting. 
Um, so what he's hoping you will all do is uh, review the feedback that General Code, the vendor, gave you. Um, I know I think you've reviewed the first 16 items. And I think there was maybe 30 in total for the zoning bylaw. And uh, come up with the recommendations on how you would respond, either no action or some action. And if you're going to take action, obviously all of those items, oh, and there, Mariah's got a, a list. Um, if any of the items require even punctuation changes, things like that, we would definitely need to have a public hearing held. Otherwise, Dick can't um, work with the vendor to get the draft ready to go. Um, so, so I guess what I would say is the sooner the planning board could review this and schedule a plan, a public hearing on what you want to present to the voters for changes, um, the sooner Dick can get that feedback incorporated into the vendor's uh, feedback and they can do their part. So we're, your part is the hardest one because you have to do public hearings. Just just to recap this for Janice and uh, oh, yeah. Sun He, uh, this is really more to help be able to search uh, our records and right now the way the bylaws are set up they're not searchable by any computer so they want to renumber it so that it, things make computer sense and we don't really need to change anything if we don't want to just the numbering correct but they had they had hired a consultant and they went through and found some discrepancies with the um, Massachusetts law and a lot of grammatical issues. So, correct. I would, I mean, if we want to get this done quick, there's like four options. We can say change it the way they suggest, change it the way we we think it should be changed, or we can say do nothing, mm -hmm. yeah, or we can wait until after we made the code number change and then go back and readdress it right so to get it done quickly ones that are difficult we could just say we're gonna i know deb you may not like that going back again to them but there's a few that we're never gonna get through like the signage one the solar one there's um you know we we've got changes we want to make to those sections but we don't have time to go through them and, and it, each one of those is gonna take quite a few meetings to get through. Um, so well, I, I'm i sorry, go ahead. I was gonna just say, Mike, to what you're saying as a, as a suggestion, it may make sense for you all to consider just adopting the chapter and sections that they're proposing to you, present that at a public hearing that would allow Dick and the vendor to roll this all into a presentation of a bylaw. Um, the, the chapters and sections allow this to become a code. Um, so the zoning bylaw would have that specific structure. And then maybe there's a couple simple things like select board is no longer a board, of, a board of selectmen. So if there's any references to the board of selectmen, make those simple changes and leave that alone for now. And specifically uh, because you all have $60,000 to hire uh, an attorney to help you work on this project and you can do a full review of your zoning and update these sections in the way that makes sense with your own consultant that may be your time to really delve into these sections that you want to have uh, more extensive work done and they will help you general code when you go to present your your articles going forward will help you set up a proposed chapter and section for all of it so when it's adopted at town meeting it just inserts right into the code like it's supposed to so, so I think your suggestion may make sense if you just could focus on the structure piece and the really simple low-hanging fruit pieces of this and maybe leave the more complex things for you and your consultant to work on afterwards, that may make sense. Have probably, Janice, you haven't seen this, but uh, Mariah sent it out again to us a, a couple of last week, I believe. So. Um, it's it's pretty boring legal stuff to go through, but <laughs> that's all I can tell you. But uh, we maybe for the next meeting, uh, you guys can look through 
Well, actually, I, I kind of like that idea if it's is make the number changes and then and any slight grammatical changes and and save the rest for later. Um, does that make sense to people? Yeah. Okay. So okay. we can work with you on all of that to get that ready for a future public hearing of yours. Yeah. Do we need to do that for have that proposed for next meeting then? Is that something you could have ready? Uh, take what we've done already. I've looked at the rest of it. I can work with somebody uh, to go through 16 through 20 uh, or 16 through the rest if if that's I don't know what's acceptable to people um, but I, I I would make I would only make small changes grammatical changes not not any major changes anywhere. I, so the, I guess the only question I have to help guide you all is, is Mariah, from your understanding of the process, does this need to go through that process where something gets sent to the select board, they send it back to trigger the hearing? Yes, and I think we would need to have very clear guidance on what that is. We would need that document from general code to be filled out with whatever the planning board is choosing to move forward with. So. So what you have on the screen in front of you is where you all left off in, in October when you were right. going through. And so these are all the things that you all agreed to back then that you were going to propose. So if you want that feedback to be sent to the select board, the chapter and section structure and these revisions one through 15, we can send that to the select board and have them send it back to you for uh, to, to officially start that public hearing process. And that would allow you to, when you schedule it, present it to the public and at least get this part done. At least that would that, could we do the whole thing that way, Brian, or would that just be one through 15? I, that's where I'm getting confused. I think I would say you've only done one through 15 so far as a group. So you've already made those decisions that you were recommending. If you wanna do the rest of them, that's fine too. But the, the four of you need time. And as you noted, it's already, 30 after nine, so I don't assume you're doing that tonight. No. Okay, why don't we, I make a motion to, as Brian just said, uh, number one was I. The, we didn't put anything down on that. So I wonder if we should just write defer decision until after code publication. Okay. And that could be for 16 through 20 or yep. through, the, through the end of it too. Thirty nine, I think there's thirty nine. So I went through it. Um, a lot of it is in the end too. There's a lot of that's just grammatical. Um, so I would rather see us tackle the last half at least the grammatical stuff so we could present it at one public hearing so we could just do all the grammatical changes one time okay that's all right so when are we going to do that at our next planning board meeting we'll go through the back half of it so uh, would that be it just to focus on that because it's going to take a while probably it usually does how long did it take y'all to do the ones that are there right now, the one through 15? How long did it take? It took us probably an hour to get through those, yeah. I would get. Yeah. I, if I can make a recommendation, I think if you all go through prior to the meeting, you note what your decisions are, I think you'll be able to move through them pretty quickly. Yeah. And then sort of tangent to all of this, I know Mike, you brought this up. You all had done some other work, I think on the introduction to your bylaws, maybe section one. Yeah, and that Janice, that was the closest thing we have to a purpose and objective 
was our introduction and we rewrote that a year ago and, and, and uh, i think you all voted to uh to support those changes correct yes so that may be one more thing that if you've already done that work and you're ready to have that go to a public hearing maybe include that in your uh, request to the select board so that they can send it back to you with any feedback and then trigger your public hearing so so that work that you've all done can finally move forward so we are we submitting one through 15 to the select board now tonight or is that what we need to sounds like you're waiting waiting until we do the whole thing next meeting i think that's what you all just discussed yeah i think that's what i'm hearing is to wait until the next meeting to do the rest of it and then okay. submit the whole thing and then the introduction that we rewrote we could send to the select board with this next meeting is that what we're thinking yeah all right all right thank you all, all right for your work. Thank you. So for next meeting, people should go through the rest of these, and if, if at least the grammatical changes. Um, okay, PUD and zoning map update. Uh, that, how are we doing on that? What is that going to the? Uh, That's count. <laughs> That's I'm already sorry. scheduled currently to be on the special town meeting warrant. Okay, great. Yep. And when do we think that's going to be? As of right now, they're looking at a March date. Okay. And the use table modifications that that one we should try to get ready for annual town meeting based on what you just discussed with jake uh because you all need to hold another public hearing on the revisions you're all discussing i think it wouldn't be in time for the march town meeting at this point so it annual would be the next chance okay and I I'm sorry to keep this meeting's going late, but re, uh, update on a new planning board member. I think uh, Melanie Burnett submitted a letter of interest. Is that Ryan? I I don't have that. I think uh, you all need to have a meeting with the select board to consider the appointment. We just need to do a quick joint meeting. Uh, we have I think I sent you the letter of interest, Mike, and and I sent it to Jake as well. So I just need you and Jake to schedule your joint meeting. And um, if we can get a majority of the planning board and the select board together, we can quickly uh, take a vote, have the two boards take a vote on an appointment. It would be an appointment through the balance of the year, which ends on May 2nd. And um, assuming you appointed that individual, they would have to seek reelection at that point, um, or the seat would be vacant again, beginning on May 2nd. So we probably wanna do it sooner than later. Ryan, would it be possible for the rest of the board to read her letter of interest? Of course. Yeah. I, 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 Mike, I don't know if you want to send it out to the board members or if you want me to send it, I can, I can do that. Yeah. Would you send it? I, 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 I tried to find it and I couldn't find it before the meeting. So. Yep. I'll be happy to send it out to all of you. Of course. Um, Brian, could I get that sent to my Gmail? I still can't get into the Irving email. Okay. Yep, I, I'll send it there, and, and Jackie and I would be happy to help you get back into your email. That would be great. I I got in like a handful of times, but for some reason I just it keeps saying it keeps sending me that code, and I try it like ten times, and then it locks me out. You know. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I, you and I can set up a time, and we can go over it and work out, get it figured out. Sounds good. Thanks. Of course. Okay, the next one, Brian. I guess we maybe if you could. Put it off to the next meeting but you sent out a tremendous amount of information mm -hmm. on uh, housing production plans and um I, it was really good but i don't think we have time to go through it tonight do we 
I agree. I'd be happy to come back at another meeting. All right, maybe put that on the next meeting. Any other topics not anticipated? Did uh, I think you skipped over the zoning consultant. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. How are we doing with that? Um, so, so I think. I said, sorry. I was I was gonna say Mariah and I need some guidance from you all, uh, but your contract has been signed, so we can finally move forward. So I sent out an email before the meeting. Um, I need guidance on whether you want to put out a request for proposals from zoning consultants and then review those proposals and select a zoning consultant that way. Or if you would like to, um, you can just select a lawyer um, who has experience in zoning law and move forward with them. I got a scope of work from one lawyer. Um, he also gave me some references. Um, so if you'd like to, call his references and find out you know you have pick a person to call his references and find out if he's someone you'd like to work with or find another zoning lawyer um or several other zoning lawyers to reach out to you you could do that but those are kind of your two main options is either put out a procurement for any zoning consultant to respond to or lawyers are um they don't have to go through the request for proposal process so you could just pick a lawyer to work with How important is it that they're a local and and can come in and meet with us or um, or I mean you can you guys are having online meetings now, so you know they could really be anywhere in the state. But I think to to the general question, you want somebody who specializes in Massachusetts zoning laws because they can be very different in different states. So you and if you're going to work with a lawyer, obviously they should be certified to practice law in the state of Massachusetts. Um, but I think that scope of work that Mariah uh, was saying that she could send out to all of you is is where you really want to spend your effort. Whether you do a procurement and go for any type of zoning professional, or if you want a lawyer, the scope of work is what we're going to attach to whatever contract you come up with. That's going to be their Schedule A. So we want to make sure that that scope of work gives you the deliverables by whatever date you want them by how detailed, if there's a number of meetings you want them to attend with you. Um, that's that's really where we want to spend our effort to make sure that you get your full benefit for the amount of money that you're going to spend. And how much are we paying this zoning consultant again? Uh, a, a grant for $60,000. It's a, it's a grant for 60000 okay. You don't have to spend it all, but that's your that's how much you can spend. Per yeah. year, per, it's a one-time grant. A one-time grant. Okay, thank you. This is to review all of your zoning bylaws, and the way that it would work is you would meet with the consultant. Um, they, you know, you would explain what your goals are, talk about how you want to achieve those goals, give them guidance on how to move forward. They would go work on drafting the changes, kind of similar to what you're looking at with the recodification, where they would show you what the existing text is and what they're proposing the change would be. And then you would all go through those changes and say yes or no, like you're doing with the recodification. So yes, we'd like to make this change. No, we wouldn't. Um, and then you would hold, hold your public hearing and then you would bring those changes to town meeting. So you would all pick anything you do or don't wanna change. The consultant is just offering advice on what you might want to change based off of you know case law or what they've seen in other communities or things that they know are outdated stuff like that okay thanks mariah i haven't i can make i can call some of the references for the one you gave us if if that's all right with people uh, i can send those over to you yeah and the scope we can talk about the scope at the next meeting if people can look at you you sent out a, a some scope information to mariah yeah i, I sent guess. out a copy of a scope um so you know obviously we'd fill in irving and you could change any objectives you want but it, it's an idea okay 
All right, we'll look, look those over before the next meeting. Anything else? Uh, <laughs> a lot to cover, I know. Uh, all right, I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. It's 9.23. I'll second. Oh, sorry, Deb. Did you want a second? No, you can. Okay. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. James. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, see, see you guys February 17th. And uh, I'll try to get some work done before that with the references. Okay. Thank you I think all. We got Thank yep. you. Good night. Thanks, Good everyone. Night. Good night. Good night.